G'day. Welcome to What's It All About, Alfie? The story of Jesus. From the end to the beginning and beyond. Come on in. Last week, we looked at the ascension of Jesus back to the right hand of God the Father, where Jesus is reigning as King. What do these four gospel accounts say about the events immediately before that ascension? As ever, check these historical documents for yourself and ascertain your own thinking as to their reliability. Last time we finished looking at the ascendancy of Jesus and his authority. And while that should be a comfort to know that he has all the authority and all things are under his control, we also asked ourselves the question as to how Jesus gets all the authority. The answer to that is partly here. Let's look at Jesus' resurrection from the dead, the rising and conquering of death by this amazing man of history. Did you know that up to 25% of the UK alone think that Jesus Christ never existed and that he is merely a mythical figure? Let's look. We see the two Marys watching the burial. Roman soldiers guard the tomb. Women prepare spices and then rest. Women arrive at dawn with those spices. An angel rolls the stone away from the tomb. Angels appear to the women. The women run back to tell the disciples. Peter and John investigate the empty tomb. Then Peter and John go home. Mary Magdalene weeps by the tomb and Mary sees two angels. Jesus' appearances. Jesus appears to Mary Magdalene. Jesus appears to the other women. The women report back to the disciples. Guards testify to the priests. Jesus appears to Peter. Two report to disciples in Jerusalem. Jesus appears to the disciples, but Thomas isn't there. The disciples report to Thomas. Then Jesus appears to the disciples and Thomas. Jesus appears to seven people at one time. Jesus appears to Peter and questions him three times. Jesus appears to over 500 people at the same time. Then lastly, Jesus appears to James. And what about the evidences for the resurrection? A biblical scholar, Sherwin White, once wrote this. For the New Testament of Acts, the confirmation of historicity is overwhelming. Any attempt to reject its basic historicity, even in matters of detail, must now appear absurd. These historical facts remain for the resurrection. Note the amazingly changed attitude of the disciples after seeing the risen Jesus. They were like new people, changed from a group of defeated, cowardly people into victorious, brave people who rejoiced. Surely the authorities would have produced his dead body in order to quench the new movement. But they didn't. Nobody who could have produced the dead body of Jesus did so. Their silence is as significant as the preaching of the apostles. Note the multiple appearances of Jesus to various numbers of individuals and groups of people at various times of the day and in differing circumstances. Look at the survival, the growth and impact of the early church. If there was no bodily resurrection of Jesus, would people really have risked persecution and death for knowing a lie, and knowing that the lie was a lie? Dealing with doubt. Okay then, let's say Jesus didn't rise from the dead. What can we say, and how can we respond to that accusation? Firstly, 
Would the disciples have really risked death for telling and maintaining a lie about the risen Jesus? Remember, they were beaten, confused and defeated men until they saw Jesus truly did rise from the dead. And after seeing him, they were transformed and a victorious people. Okay then, how about this one? Somebody stole the body. Oh, that must be it, surely. Hardly likely. And if that did occur, for what reason? How would they have got past the Roman guard and moved the stone a great distance from the tomb? Eh, wrong. Thirdly, well, Jesus didn't die, but he merely fainted and recovered consciousness in the tomb. Well, even the skeptics disagree with this theory, one of whom said, It is impossible that a being who had stolen half-dead out of the sepulchre, who crept about weak and ill, wanting medical treatment, who required bandaging, strengthening and indulgence, and who still at last yielded to his sufferings, could have given to the disciples the impression that he was a conqueror over death and the grave, the Prince of Life. Again, <coughs> wrong. Fourthly, ah, they went to the wrong tomb. That must be it. They all went to the wrong tomb. <coughs> wrong. Whilst one person may have gone to a wrong tomb, not everybody would have done so. Certainly not the Roman guards. And lastly, well, Jesus didn't die on the cross, but somebody was substituted for him. Yeah, right. Eh, wrong. This is certainly untenable, given the rigidity and strict record-keeping of Roman rule, and with the eyes of the Jewish hierarchy watching. The Significance of the Resurrection So what is the significance of the resurrection? The resurrection of Jesus Christ provided the central theme for the sermons and teaching in the early church. But what significance is there? We can easily see that the physical resurrection of Jesus Christ proved and vindicated all of Jesus' teaching, his claim to be the suffering servant, and attested to him being fully God and the last judge of all mankind. The resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead declares God's approval of Jesus' obedient service and the fulfillment of all the Old Testament promises resulting in forgiveness of sins and salvation being only found in and through Jesus Christ. And this was the prime motivation for evangelism in the early church. Jesus' resurrection is a sign of the bodily resurrection for all believers in him, which should give us a new attitude to death and transforms hopes. As the resurrected King, the ascended King, the living King, Jesus now intercedes for us and has perfected the redemption of all those who choose to follow him. Jesus still meets people today. And Jesus is still living. You know what? He meets with people at the present time. Or well, certainly that's my experience. Many people since Jesus' ascension have encountered the, the risen and ascended Jesus. How does he do this? Jesus walks with us wherever we go, and in particular the darkest periods of our life. I know that I would not be here if it was not for Jesus. Just as Jesus did with the two people on the road to Emmaus, he walks with those who claim to follow him. Jesus speaks whenever the Bible is faithfully preached and read from, just as he opened the eyes of those on the Emmaus Road when he explained the scriptures. Jesus meets his followers in the Holy Communion with the bread and the wine which symbolizes his flesh and his blood. So if that is Jesus as the risen king, what is there to say about his death? Why did Jesus need to die as he did? What has Jesus' death got to do with God? Moreover, what has Jesus' death got to do with humanity, and in particular with us? For that, you'll have to come back next time. Thanks for joining us. See you later.